So this afternoon, it's my pleasure to introduce Bree Fram, who is co-edited with Mel Emser Herbert, a collection of 26 essays from current service members or veterans serving in the military as transgendered persons. This is the paperback launch of this book. Um, and Fram is an active duty lieutenant colonel and astronautical engineer in the US Space Force, and also the president of Sparta, a nonprofit that advocates and educates about transgender military service and is dedicated to the support and professional development of over 1,700 transgender service members. And I'm just going to give brief introductions of the rest of the panelists and let them um, add to that when they speak. Uh, she'll be joined in conversation today by Danny Butler, who served in the Marines for 22 years with assignments all over the country and the world. Miranda Jones, who's also a retired US Marine and government civil servant. Sabrina Bruce, who's an active duty member of the US Space Force. And Jamie Hash, an active duty Air Force Master Sergeant. Please help me welcome our authors. Well, thanks to Politics and Prose for having us here. This is really exciting to actually get together in person to have an event like this. So what I figured is I'm going to give you a little bit of the insight into how this book came to be and more importantly, why this book came to be. Um, and then we're going to turn it over mostly to our panelists to talk about their stories and, and why they contributed. But the most exciting part of any event like this is, is when we get to engage with you and take your questions and kind of understand what's, what's on your mind and, and maybe even dispel some of the myths that are out there about transgender military service. So let me take you back. Um, Transgender people have only been allowed to serve openly in the United States military for just over six years. For the longest time, we were banned by policy um, or by custom in many cases, and were unable to serve openly. You know, people who were found out as being trans would lose their career for something that had absolutely nothing to do with their ability to serve. Very similar to what happened under Don't Ask, Don't Tell and all prior exclusionary policies for gays and lesbians, and even back further, other minorities that couldn't serve. And what's interesting is as those minorities were integrated into the military, they faced all the same arguments that trans people are facing today. And we can go back and look at African Americans in the 40s and 50s as being disruptive to unit cohesion or just you know, not being capable of meeting the standards of service or serving with other people in a way that would be a disruption. Those are the same arguments still thrown at all of us today. But thankfully, we did have people come in, serve, break barriers, and prove that there was a way for trans people to serve openly. So in 2016, we were able to do so. Uh, Secretary of Defense Ash Carter announced that people could serve openly, and several of us at that time came out. You know, we had this euphoric moment of, is this it? Can we do this? Can we really be ourselves? That's awesome. But sadly, those euphoric feelings didn't last very long. It was just over a year later that I was sitting on my very last day of leave uh, overlooking this beautiful lake at a cabin in northern Minnesota. It was serene, but my phone started blowing up. And what happens in the summer of 2017? Well, we were at heightened tensions with North Korea. And, you know, it was the question of whose button is bigger. You know, are we going to go to war, nuclear war with North Korea? And so I figured, what is going on? What, what are all these alerts on my phone? What's happening? And so what do you do in that time to figure out what's going on in the world? You check Twitter. And it turns out that President Trump had tweeted and his first tweet said that the United States government can neither accept nor allow. And then there was a 10 minute pause. I'm like, what did the North Koreans do that we can't accept? Is this it? But no, what the United States government couldn't accept or allow was trans people serving in the military which he finished in two more tweets saying that we were a burden and a disruption and we couldn't have any trans people serving in the military. So against that backdrop, uh, a couple years earlier, um, my co-editor, uh, Mel, had done some research and, and some writing on trans service, you know, kind of helping to pave the way for what would eventually be open service. And he, he got the, to this point in time and he realized Hey, this is something we need to explore 
more. I mean, it's even more important now than ever. And I had been one of the people that he interviewed or, uh, several years before that. And they reached out to me and said, you want to do this together? And I'm like, Hell yes, I do. Because in a weird way, I look back at President Trump's tweets and I say, thank you. Why? Because he's shown a spotlight on our service that had never been there before. And at the time, about 50% of the American public and 50% of currently serving members of the military thought that trans people should be able to serve openly. That's quite a divide. But two months after he tweeted, 70% of the American public and the military were in favor. Two years later, it was in the high 80s. And why was that? It was the power of story. It was the fact that you saw people like these panelists and so many others on media worldwide, a trans drill sergeant in the center of People magazine, a trans military couple on the Ellen show. Their stories were everywhere and it proved that they could serve both here at home and around the world and opinions changed quickly. Story is our most powerful weapon to do that. So putting this book together was an absolute labor of love. We recount some of that history uh, that I briefly touched on, but the heart of the book is 26 different essays from amazing people who show that there is no one way to be trans and there is certainly no one way to be trans in the military. Their experiences are wildly different. Uh, some are funny, some are poignant, some are sad, and all things in between. So we have an amazing panel here with us, and I'm so happy all of them chose to contribute to this book. Uh, so between my story and theirs, we have five of the 26 people featured in this essay in the room, which is amazing that all of us just happen to live here in the DC area at this time. Now, I do want to acknowledge that, you know, you have a panel up here that is not very diverse. The stories in, in there are more so. And so the stories of trans people in the military are not just those of white women. Um, we have a lot of privilege uh, that others don't. And so experiences do vary based on many intersectional identities. But I'm gonna throw it over to the panel uh, at this point, and I'd like each of them to give just a little introduction to their service, but more importantly, answer the question, what was it that made you contribute to this book? Miranda, you're a deer in the headlights, so we're gonna start <laughs> with you. Or, or we'll start with Jamie if her microphone works. I can try. I can try that. Hello. There we go. Trajan. Trajan, there we go. Uh, thanks, dear, dear. Um, what was the question again? Why did I contribute? Who are you? Who am I? Right. Um, okay, so. Um, well, actually, the, the first one is tough. Um, and I think this may be a, um, uh, I won't say a door opener, a bit of a window opener, though. Um, I am Miranda Lewis um, in the book. I am Miranda Jones, um, and I think when you read my essay, um, you may see the connection there that this is just another example of how we hid. Um, I didn't go by the name, my actual given legal name, Lewis, uh, as I do now, um, because I wasn't out to the world, obviously. Um, and, I, and I think that is an indication of the, the sunglasses, if you will, that many of us uh, have hidden behind in, in many different ways. Um, so, uh, Miranda Lewis, uh, retired U.S. Marine, 30 years in the Marine Corps. Uh, I am currently a civil servant. I am a professor of program management um, down at Fort Belvoir. Uh, that's really mostly me. I'm a parent. I've got four kids. Two of them followed me into the Marine Corps. Uh, I apologize to them profusely for that all the time. Um, why did I contribute to the book? Um, the timing of Bree's request for contributions uh, was very fitting for me. Uh, at that time, I was still uh, very early in my own journey, uh, my own journey of discovery. Um, again, you can see in my essay that I spent my entire active career um, running from, uh, avoiding, completely ignoring uh, who I actually was. 
Uh, and uh, it took a very serendipitous event uh, for me to even be uh, shown that I was allowed to look at myself and, and say, who are you? Uh, it is okay if you don't recognize the answer and if you don't like the answer, and most importantly, if other people don't like the answer. Um, so that's why, uh, for me, I thought this was a great opportunity, honestly, kind of in a selfish way. Uh, it helped me with my own therapy, uh, to sort of get at the bottom of how on earth did I go 47 years without admitting to myself, uh, who I really was. So trade you back. Jamie. Hi, everyone. I'm Jamie Hash, um, active duty master sergeant in the Air Force, currently stationed here in the D.C. area at the Pentagon. Uh, I work in A3 operations doing global force management. I know it's a lot of buzzword stuff, but um, basically I I'm doing amazing things here at the Pentagon. It's a privilege. I just got back here from England after a three-year tour there um, with my wife, who's, who's here with us. Uh, I've been in for going on 11 years now, and... I came out right after the ban was lifted. Um, it just so happened to be the week before San Antonio Pride when I was stationed in Texas. So it was an amazing Pride celebration that year. Um, but after I came out and really finding my stride with everything, uh, that's when I can now say I've been fired by the President of the United States via Twitter. I feel like not many people can say that. Um, and that just kind of motivated me and gave me more drive than ever. I started getting more involved with sharing my story and advocating, which I never wanted to do. I never wanted to be on the news or be public or be out. I just wanted to fly under the radar, just do my thing. Um, but because of that, it gave me an opportunity uh, to use that platform and leverage it to share my story. And then once Bree started this initiative with the book, I thought it was a perfect way um, just to tie everything together, and it was truly an honor. Um, Bree's just been doing incredible things with our community, and just being able to support that endeavor um, is just an absolute honor and privilege. So, thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Sabrina? Hi, I'm Sabrina Bruce. I'm uh, in the Space Force, like Bree mentioned, and I've been serving for nine years now, and I transitioned in 2017, so the majority of my career now has been serving as a transgender person openly and being able to live as my authentic self. I work right down the road in Chantilly at the National Reconnaissance Office and there I do cybersecurity. It's uh, kind of typical for trans people to work in IT of some sort. So I'm fulfilling that. <laughs> um, why did I contribute? So when I first started struggling with my identity when I was very young, I looked around in the early 2000s and there was nobody. There was nobody to look to Nobody to look at and see, hey, there's a successful trans person. There's somebody doing what I want to do. So I wanted to take that, that struggle that I'd had when I was younger and turn it into something for other trans people to see. So I took that story. I put it in the book. I've um, done articles in the news as well. And I've just tried to be as public as possible. And being public, I'm sure, as everyone can share here, is sometimes very hard. It's hard when people judge you before they even get to know you. It's hard to go out on the streets and, you know, sometimes deal with those, that negative repercussion. But I don't regret that because I hope and I know that my story helps other people. And that's what I'm here for. Even if it's helped just one person, that's all that mattered to me. Thanks, Sabrina. Uh, Danny. Thank you. I'm going to take advantage of speaking to Stan. Uh, my name is Danny Butler. And I served in the Marines from 1975 to 1998. During my time frame, uh, there was only one word, uh, the transvestite. That was all I'd ever heard. And I didn't know, well, I'm not at that. And I was in a church that taught being LGBT was a sin. And I tried everything I could to fight it. Um, even though I was trying to fight it while in the military, in secret, I would still find time to dress because it felt comfortable to me. I don't know why. I just, it felt right. And I would hide that. After I retired in 98, um, I found some groups because computers started coming around. And I started meeting other people amongst them. I met Bree and we were going out and I really, oh my gosh, it was just, it was such a great feeling. And I would get home at night after being out 
and having to take off the makeup and the wig and just break into tears because I love being me so much. During that time frame, as I met Bree, I, in conversation with her, I learned what was going on politically, and I heard about how they were going to lift the ban. When they lifted the ban, I had to inform the VA because I was discharged with a military, a service-connected disability, and I wanted to let the VA know that hey, it's not just what's on active duty. We've been around for a long time. And I'll never forget how the jaw dropped on my VA doctor, and I had to show her all these pictures of me, and she's like, that's you? And uh, it was just quite a moment. And so through the history of knowing Bree, I got involved in the book. And, and one of my greatest, pride, proudest moments in my life is when the ban was reinstated. I was, I was on the front lawn with her and some others here, Miranda, uh, just to say how we felt it was wrong. And so I enjoyed that participation. I wanted to let the VA know we've been there all along, even if I didn't know what it was. And eventually, through meeting v Bree and others, I realized that my life had to change or else. Thanks, Danny. And I think you bring up a fascinating point that you know, we can look at actual VA data and trans people have historically served at twice the rate of their cisgender counterparts. I mean, that's amazing. Uh, it, it may be for a great number of reasons. It may be things to get away from uh, or to run from, but now we see it as this amazing thing where they can serve and, and be their best selves. As discriminatory policies fall away, we're in an era where people serve because they know they now can. Uh, in fact, just last year, uh, the Undersecretary of the Air Force wanted to hold a celebration for the 10-year anniversary of the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And she asked an, a number of folks to gather in the courtyard uh, who had served through that so they could celebrate being themselves. And when she went out there, she saw a bunch of people and she turned to her staff and said, there is no way any of these people are old enough to have served through Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And her staff said, no, ma'am, these are people who serve now because Don't Ask, Don't Tell is gone. And what we have today is an environment where trans people are in the same position. They can serve because they can be their best selves. So to our panel, what I want to ask, and, and it's a little different question to Miranda and Danny than it is to Sabrina and Jamie, but first to, to those of you who served in silence, you know, what were the drawbacks of that to you? How did that affect you as a person or you as a career? And to Sabrina and, and Jamie, what was it like to come out and reach for your full authentic self? What did that enable you to do afterwards that maybe you couldn't have beforehand? So I'll actually start with, with Danny uh, on the end. So sorry, you get the least thinking time. Not a problem. Um, as I stated, I had a service-connected disability, and uh, what had happened was a tent fell on my head, compressed my spine, and so the government trying to give me pain pills would actually help me because I didn't realize it. They were actually antidepressants, and it helped me carry on into my life. Um, the person I was before, as a master sergeant and marine, I was pretty good at that, and I had a lot of anger within me. Uh, during my transition, initially when I talked to my wife, because it was hard for her, uh, we'd been married uh, over 35 years when I came out to her, and she had no clue. Um, but I asked her, I wanted to start HRT, and I use this story as an example, because uh, the initial agreement was that I could try it for six months. At six months, those changes are pretty irreversible. And it was after six weeks on HRT that my wife came up to me and said, hey, remember that conversation we're going to have at the six-month mark? She go, I go, yes. She goes, we don't need it. I see what it's doing for you. You're a better person. And she could see how much calmer I am now, how much more I understand people, and just, it feels so good to be myself and have everything right in me. And to, to serve in that silence, that was my purgatory, I think. Miranda? I think um, the, the, the biggest drawback, the, the detractor, was... Um, that without knowing it, I had this weight on my shoulders, this this fog in my head um, that I was always striving to get around, uh, that I didn't know 
uh, I didn't realize what it was coming from. Um, I just always knew that there was more there. Um, I, I, the benefit, however, was probably that I absolutely poured myself into being a Marine. Um, there's, as some will say, a little bit of brainwashing at boot camp uh, and OCS. Uh, just a little bit. And, um, and so it was nice, I think, to be able to have something to say, this is what you can be. Um, somebody in a big brown hat gave you an identity, be that identity. Um, so that was good. Um, the drawback, though, uh, because I joined the Marine Corps before I met my wife, um, was same thing. Um, gosh, we'd been married 25, 26 years um, when I finally came out to her. Um, and to me, that's the biggest drawback is having to tell people, I didn't hide this from you alone. I was hiding it from me as well. Um, and, and so that probably was the biggest drawback, um, detractor, whatever we could call it. Yeah, the way I like to talk about that is that for anyone who serves in the closet, who serves in silence, there's a mental cost to doing so. Uh, and what we all have to do is we put this filter in our brains that sits in between our thoughts and either our actions or the words that come out of our mouths. And when you have that filter in your brain, you can be good at your job, you can even be great at your job, but you cannot be your best because it is slowing you down. So I wanna ask the two of you about what is it like to have that gone? What were those experiences that changed for you now that you can serve authentically? So it took me um, over 20 years to finally accept who I was. And at that time, I was a few years into the military. And during my first deployment, um, that's when I finally uh, just like came to terms with who I was and what I want, needed to do in my life. And at that time, it was a couple years before the ban was lifted. But I knew that I was no longer going to be able to keep serving in the military because I needed to take the steps I needed to take to just live my life authentically. Um, and once I got to that point and I had started coming out to a few very close friends and family members, it was a very long uh, year to two years that it was that time knowing what I wanted to do and needed to do, but just not being able to do that. And I think that made it even harder. And so once that door opened and I was able to walk through, it changed so much. Um, I think the biggest change for me was just connecting to other people. Um, coming out and uh, in the military and publicly going through a transition in a unit, it makes you very vulnerable. I mean, everyone sees this uh, process you're going through, um, but it also allows them to connect with you. And so I think that vulnerability had a lot of power because people were approaching me who I'd served with for years and opening up about things that I never knew about. They were sharing very, very um, secret things that they hadn't shared with anyone else. So I took that um, with great responsibility, but also a great privilege. Uh, I was able to be myself and be a better version of myself, but also connect with all those people around me in a better fashion. Yeah, so before I was in the Space Force, I was in the Air Force. And at basic training, you know, it's hard, it's tough. I don't know how Marine basic training is, but at Air Force basic training, you have a lot of time to think as well. And so one of the core values of the Air Force is integrity first. So during those times in basic training, I would struggle with my identity. So how could I be true to the military if I wasn't being true to myself, if I wasn't able to represent and be who I was? You know, there was a guy who lived right down the street in the 1860s who said, a house divided cannot stand. So that was the same for me. As I was serving these two dual identities, I was so wrapped up in that identity, trying to divide my male half and make sure I was masculine enough. You know, I was cognizant of what kind of pen I used. You know, if I had a purple pen, I would sit it down and make sure nobody saw me using a purple pen. I didn't want anybody to think I was feminine or anything like that because they may know my secret. And I couldn't have that happen because being in the military was the best thing that had happened to me. I couldn't have that taken away. It was the first place where I felt like I belonged. So having all that wiped away once I transitioned allowed me to be my full self and just thrive. You know, I was, last year I was selected promotion to Master Sergeant and 
I was my first time and I've only been in nine years. It's pretty unheard of to rank up that quickly. And I give all of that, all that credit to my transition, for just being able to be who I am. So you, you actually lead into my next question really well with that. Before I do that, ask that question though, I want to say I have tons of questions for the panel. I'm going to ask one more and I would love to get audience questions at that point. But if you don't, don't worry because I've got a million of them. Um, but I want to ask the panel about stereotypes. And you bring it up really well in that you were striving because of, of who you were, which tends to be pretty common among people who like, we need to prove ourselves. So we're actually going to go above and beyond. But those aren't the stereotypes that exist for trans people in the military. And I'll give one brief example of mine before turning it to the panel. Uh, I was working in Air Force International Affairs, uh, and I had been there about six, six to nine months, and my boss retired. And he called me into his office before he went and he said, you broke my stereotype of what a trans person is just by showing up to work and getting the job done. And I'm like, whoa, sir, that's a really low bar. You know, I can just step over that pretty easily every day when in fact what you'll find is there are people like Sabrina who are crushing it and doing amazing things. And Jamie is the exact same way, winning awards left and right well above uh, her organizational level. That's who trans people are in the military. But so I'm going to ask the panel and I'm going to open this up to whoever wants to, to talk on this. What are some of those stereotypes out there for trans service members and how do you break them? How do you change people's hearts and minds on who and what trans people are? So who's daring enough to go first? Looks like it's Sabrina. I think you just have to be open and honest with people and look them in the eye and have them look you in the eye and confront those stereotypes head on. Um, when I first, I first transitioned in 2017 and then shortly after I moved to Korea to live out there for a year. And in Korea, you live in dorms, you live on base, everybody's there. So my hair was short, I was, you know, my transition was just beginning. So I'd have to go to the DFAC, the dining facility for those not informed, um, every day. And I had to walk in front of these people. And it felt a lot of times like I was a sheep walking into the lion's den. The military is very masculine and full of men. So people would look at me, stare at me, whatever. And so the best way to look down those stereotypes was to hold my head up high. Even when I wanted to run back to my room and sit in my dorm room, I went to the DFAC every day and held my head high because I knew that's what people expected me to do. They expected me to hide. They expected me to be ashamed, but I was living my best life. I had never been happier. And so I wanted to prove that to people and to show that I wouldn't go back into the closet and I wouldn't hide from anyone. So Danny Miranda, maybe I'll, I'll frame it differently and maybe you can speak to, to this, that, you know, there's this conception out there that trans women in the military are weeping messes who could never return fire from their foxhole because they're too busy thinking about what they're going to wear that night or what their gender identity is. Or that trans men are steroidal rage monsters who are just going to charge and get everyone killed. Is that true? My two, my two wars, three combat tours, and numerous awards would say no. <laughs> short, succinct. Uh, Danny, is there anything you'd like to add on, on that? Um, during my service, we didn't have any wars. The closest I came was on a POW MIA recovery mission, uh, and I was in Cambodia, which is a totally different situation. We were not armed, and uh, gunfire rounds went over our head. We thought the Khmer Rouge were invading, uh, and later on we found out, no, it was our guards tripped and fired off their gun. Uh, <laughs> So I don't have the war experience, although I did stain my drawers that day. <laughs> but uh, no, um, in life, I was told what I had to be. How did I end up in the Marines? I was trying to do what society told me. You know, when I got married, I was trying to do what society told me. Uh, I thought, let me have children, maybe that'll fix me. You know, um, I wish that I was not transgender when I was younger and now that I'm able to be myself I'm very happy with it and I'm glad but as as far as our transgender people 
a threat to the military because of their feminine traits? Oh, no. <laughs> It's like I told my children, you know, okay, so I'm not going to, they said, they told me they weren't going to call me mom. That's, that's fine. Disrespect your mom and you'll see the dad in me come out. I can still be that person. <laughs> Anything you want to add, Jamie? I mean, I think I've heard every misconception there is out there. Um, we heard, I heard all the arguments about um, finances, um, but that was rebuked and then against unit cohesion and you already talked on that. Um, stereotypes, I, I think most people I've talked to in the military, I'm the first trans person that they've met that they're aware of. And so uh, whatever stereotypes they have, I don't know if I break them or not. I think uh, now that I've, I'm just so comfortable uh, in who I am, it, people just, it's not a thing anymore. Um, so I might be breaking stereotypes, don't know. Don't know what they are for the, those people, but, uh, but yeah, that's about it. All right, so if anyone has a question, there is a microphone up here. Um, if you're not comfortable using the microphone, I can repeat it for you, but would love to take questions from any of you. Otherwise, I will keep throwing them out to the panel. All right, great, thank you. Hey there, uh, thanks for being here today. Um, I know that a lot of uh, LGBT spaces are kind of left of the left politically um, and sometimes can be anti-military, so do you ever um, in trans spaces face suspicion for being in the military or being veterans? Oh, that is a, a fabulous question. And it really illustrates a tension some of us have to walk between because on both sides of the spectrum, there are people that hate us. Uh, and, and that's tough. You know, where do you go to, to find your group? Uh, and figuring out how to walk that line and to work on both sides and convince for totally different reasons that we're all human uh, and, and we all care about some of the same things any of you care about, that's challenging. And it also kind of is there's a tension in the military too about that between the military being this hidebound uh, structured, very traditional organization, but also being a young person's organization. And the tension is very similar. How do you navigate those different things? And I think that actually builds some of us in amazing ways with some of the skills and capacities and abilities to relate that we have. So I'll open it up if any of the panel has more thoughts on that of how you navigate that area between two poles. Danny? I don't, do I really need this? Yes. <laughs> As a retired master sergeant, I don't think. Anyway, I want that left of the left. Um, within our community, we're not left of the left. Uh, it, it's hard for me to comprehend that there are some members that uh, voted for Trump on his reelection. I'll give that as an example, knowing that he was anti transgender. So within our community, not everybody goes that same way. Uh, Personally, I don't understand it, but I just wanted to add out there, you know, yes, we can find comfort in that community, and some think they can find it in the other, too, although I don't understand that. So I like to say that uh, the military is the largest employer of transgender people in the United States, so I think that's one argument for the military. Um, it's very appealing to a lot of LGBTQ people in rural areas wanting to get out and travel and see something different and maybe do something bigger than themselves. Um, I, I, we talk about this all the time where there are certain times where we'll be in uh, leftist groups, I think is how it was phrased, and there's an anti-military um, argument or something like that and I mean all you can do is just have a conversation with that person um, speak where you're coming from a lot of those people have no interaction with military members uh, they might not have even had a conversation with someone in the military so dispelling some of the myths via military and then with people on maybe the right dispelling some of the myths for trans service members so we're just always kind of finding our way through through both sides of that yeah, it's, it's always interesting to be in an environment where I may disagree with you, but we signed up to defend your right to have that position. Um, and that's something that I think we all have to hold in any of those conversations where that comes up. And I think uh, being transgender is inherently advantageous in terms of uh, being able to see both sides. Um, you know, 
I've seen through two different sets of eyes uh, in this life, um, which inherently, like I said, it opens up uh, your ability to empathize, empathize um, but also just to recognize uh, and to be aware, not just accepting in terms of, okay, whatever your opinion is, I'll let you have it uh, because, you know, it's not polite to punch you or whatever, um, but to genuinely um, say, okay, well, if anyone here should be open to a differing perspective, it ought to be me. Um, and, and I think that's actually been a very big advantage. Um, and I've actually found in, in conversations because I've got, uh, I've got absolute polar opposite uh, family members. Uh, if I could just find one family member somewhere in the middle of the road, um, gatherings would be much easier. Uh, but because of that, again, uh, the ability to be able to say, okay, um, that's, that's fair. Um, I may not agree with it, but, but that's fair. And, you know, uncle fill in the blank over here, his position's fair too. And, and maybe you could just pass the gravy and we could all (laughs) move on, you know? All right. Any other questions out there? Yeah. So just to repeat the question in case anyone wasn't able to hear that, really just asking, you know, does the inclusion of trans people change the military in positive ways? Uh, Are there some areas where us being involved makes a difference, whether that's in discrimination, hazing, bullying, you know, uh, is there a different perspective that trans people may bring to those aspects of military life? I think like was hit on earlier, just being able to empathize helps a lot with that being able to go into a shop or a work center and be that beacon for people to know they can come to you and to know that any kind of bullying, hazing, or any of that won't be tolerated in my shop or my section or work center, wherever. I think that helps everyone in my shop and hopefully in my squadron and my wing, my group, everywhere, just to be able to be that example. Sure. Um, I think I've actually been able to instill that view uh, in my daughters. Uh, Two of my daughters, as I said, are Marines. Um, Yeah, females in the Marine Corps, which is not far from the challenge that I faced uh, on active duty. But my transition, my coming out to them, has reinstilled in them um, what I think were really largely just words that they heard, you know, everybody can do everything and girls, you too can, you can be amazing uh, in the Marine Corps, um, just like I was. They have a much more real example now to be able to say, yeah, you're darn right I can. There's absolutely nothing I can't do. Um, and, you know, for them, because uh, they still use that title, thanks, Daddy, for instilling that Um uh, it, you know, even after my service, um, and and given them uh, the the viewpoint, the the confidence to say, it doesn't matter what the stereotype is. Um, one of my daughters is a free fall jump master. Um, you know how many f- females in the military are free fall qualified? It's a small number, uh, and even more small number are jump masters. Um, yeah, you're darn right, she is. So. So I think the answer is is yes, absolutely. But we're at the end of a long journey uh, on this. And we're not the end of the journey, but we're a part of it. Because every minority group that has been integrated into the military has something to say about that. And I'm doing a, a second book that I'm working on right now about how LGBTQ folks develop as leaders. And a lot of it applies to uh, minorities of all varieties in the military. And one of the most striking things that you find in talking to people, and and I'm pretty sure these folks would all have the same opinion. In fact, I know Sabrina does because she's in that book, too, uh, is about how you develop this outward facing style of leadership that says it's not about me, but it's about we. And more importantly, it's not that I went through some stuff, so you're going to have to go through this stuff. It's about 
I went through some stuff and I want to make it so you don't have to go through this. It's about developing the conditions that allows everyone to blossom and flourish without having to go through some of those truly negative things to prove that they belong or to just suffer in order to be part of the club. Um, and I think we're in a long line of people that are bringing that perspective and we are getting better, but we've got a long ways to go. Anything else to add? All right. Oh, we got a cup. One more at the microphone here. Hello. Um, my name is Heather Haley. Um, I'm a historian at the Naval History and Heritage Command, so I won't hold it against you that you don't have any Navy service members today. Um, and I would also like to say that my question is not a reflection of anything that the United States Navy, all of that. Um, but um, I was hoping that you could, uh, I apologize for bringing the tenor down for this question, but I am really intrigued by the tenuousness of your visibility um, in terms of the actual um, um, federal um, words are not happening now. Um, uh, in terms of the actual policies um, and uh, speaking frankly and unfortunately, like allowing your existence in the military and the tenuousness of that, because you spoke about the excitement in 2016 and then it was taken away a year later. And what does that mean? Um, not only, you know, physically, um, but also like, how does that make you feel? Yeah, that is is a challenging question, and I'll I'll take us back to a little bit of a little bit more history uh, before turning it over to the panel to answer this. But I do like to start uh, off with that. I think it's a quote from Albert Camus who said, uh, "Live so free that your very existence is an act of rebellion," and and that's kind of what we're doing in, in a way is by just existing, we are changing things. But again, to go back to all those groups that have integrated into the military, it's all been done by executive order. There are no laws that say everyone can serve. Even the repeal of don't ask, don't tell replaced a negative law with nothing, not a positive law saying LGB people can serve. So we still serve at the whim of the executive. And in 2024, if things change, uh, we could again uh, be facing a, a fight for our very careers. Um, so if there's anything that you know you can speak to about transgender service members, it's their resilience to have served through that and gone through it again. But I'll ask the panel, what does it feel like, and this is particularly for Jamie and Sabrina, what does it feel like knowing that we could go through all of this all over again? Yeah, I think the biggest word is resiliency. <laughs> and so uh, I've always thought I've been pretty resilient, um, bouncing back from obstacles in my life, but whew, that was definitely a, a big test. Um, I think it was just like the uncertainty. I, I learned more about the court system in the United States than I ever wanted to know uh, in the year or two that we were just waiting to see what was gonna happen. And, uh, and it, it was hard, because um, you're constantly thinking about that, in fact, your mind while you're still trying to do your mission. Um, so honestly, I think that's the adverse effect on our troops, um, rather than letting people just be who they are and um, be their best selves. And so I think uh, ultimately you just have to press forward, um, knowing that there's nothing you control in that situation, um, control of influence and just do what you can uh, really to get through everything. And I think um, having this community has was a huge help because uh, especially if you're not stationed with any other trans service members, having that connection via social media and via those groups uh, makes a world of difference because you see thousands of other people all over the world in different branches doing the same thing and just striving to do the best that they can for their unit and for their mission. Sabrina? Yeah, it's tough. And, you know, I'd be lying if I said part of that isn't a reason I'm here. You know, when I look out in this audience, I'm sure some of you knew about transgender service members and some of you walking around maybe knew, but I see in each one of you a chance to share our story with you and a chance to make another ally, to have another friend in the fight as we go forward and try to get this our service enshrined in law. And if it does come down to that moment, I hope that each one of you can have our backs and can be there for us. Because you know, our voice is one thing, but everyone's voice combined together makes a difference. So Danny, Miranda, what are some of those things that people can do to be an ally and to help make sure there is a future for transgender people in military service? 
Right now, I work as a DBA on the Army Human Resource Software. Mainly, I handle phone calls from S1, the admin offices, OICs. I'm talking with Chief Warrant Officer, twos, threes, fours, and occasionally a WO1 that got put in charge of an office and really needs help. And a lot of them didn't know who I was, and I get served often. And I usually have to say, look, one, I retired in 1998 and I hated sir then. Two, it's Danny, I'm a trans woman. I think that I continue to do that and I'm educating people that have gone through this in active duty and make them realize we're here, we're going to be around. The continuation of this support is necessary. As a normal person, uh, I say normal, cis, somebody that was born with the gender that they identify that same gender, if they could just stand up and say, hey, this is the way God made them, leave them alone. That's all we need people to do. Stand up and say, let them be who they are. What, what's the big deal? And don't be afraid. And if you don't want to say it in public, at least say it in the voting booth, please. <laughs> so just briefly, because we want to get to, to more questions, uh, the three real simple things anyone can do. One, share our stories. Uh, we've shown how powerful that is. It is an incredible way, whether via social media, via the book, anything else, share the story, allow people to connect and, and realize that we're human. Two, call or write your elected representatives. Hugely important. Sometimes a single voice is all it takes to change a position. And three, if financially able, please donate to causes that support human rights for everyone, not just trans service members, but everyone. That's important. Um, So basically the question is, is transgender service policy and or policy related to the Department of Veterans Affairs in a good place? Um, we've had a few years. Is it where it should be or is there still work to go? So start with the the active component and, and the three of us are all in the Department of the Air Force. Um, so what is policy like? Where can we still make improvements? I think there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, we have, the Department of the Air Force has a group uh, called LIT, the LGBTQ Initiative Team, which focuses on uh, such thing. We have a specific line of effort for transgender, gender diverse policies. Um, there's a lot of work we still need to do. Um, a lot of specific down in the weeds um, to high level policies. Uh, um, Bree's doing a lot of the frontline effort, so I'll, I'll let you talk about some of those like specifics if you want. Well. I wouldn't want to necessarily get into specifics, but as Jamie said, we're, we're looking at barriers and how to knock them down. But any new military policy is going to be rough around the edges. Mm -hmm. And we had a policy in place for just about a year. In fact, much less than a year when the actual policies came out. And then we immediately went like to a period where, mm, no, we are not going to make this policy better. In fact, we might actually be trying to actively make it worse and to force you out of service. So now we're back in an area where, again, okay, let's look at what impedes someone's career. What are the challenges someone might face? Why is this trans person who's taking a medication being treated completely differently from a cisgender person who's taking the same thing? That's the big area where we need to improve and stop having this fear that we're fragile, we're broken, uh, when instead we're just reaching for our best selves and all we're doing is getting better at what we're what we're doing and what we're capable of doing for the military than anything else. Um, Danny, Miranda, anything you want to talk about in your areas? Yeah, um, it's a mixed bag. Um, the VA is fantastic. Uh, Danny and I both get 100% of our trans care through the VA. Um, okay. Um, I, um, so there's that. But then at the same time, as a federal employee, um, I'm not allowed to have a pride flag, mug, sticker, or anything in my office. I cannot display that. Um, 
So it is a mixed bag in terms of has policy caught up? Uh, and, and again, I think part of that goes back to your previous question about, you know, at the whim of, well, you know, who lives at 1600, who's been determined to, to sit at the um, Office of the Secretary of Defense desk, things like that. Um, but for the most part, um, it's good stuff. You know, we're definitely heading in the right direction without question. All right, I think we probably have time for one more question before we wrap up. So please. So we, we acknowledge up front that we are a woefully non-diverse panel up, <laughs> up here. Um, but the book is not. And the book has some of those stories in it. And it is fascinating to see the differences for trans men versus trans women. How often the trans men are stepping into a world of privilege where we're stepping away from it. And it's amazing to see some of those differences and some people who who have it and realize it or lose it and don't realize it and how some of those interactions may occur but at an individual level the stories are just that individual um and and some people do talk about that in the book about how all of a sudden i mean just possibilities open up to them um where Though we've mostly had positive experiences and, and amazing support, some people don't. Uh, and maybe that's because the three of us are in the Air Force and Space Force um, and not in the Marines or the Army, uh, where some of those experiences may be a little different. And we have someone in the audience who I know is laughing at this question <laughs> because she's seen it. Um, but yes, the experiences are different. I don't know if anyone else has anything they want to add on that. I think it's... Um... It was very telling to me when some of my trans men friends were told me about how they were surprised to hear how men spoke in the locker room or when it was just a group of men. And, you know, so that's something that you know, made me laugh, but also made me sad because it's true. You know, men talk differently when it's a group of men. And so now here was this person experiencing that for the first time. And it made them kind of second guess their whole life. Like how many times have I been talked about behind my back in groups of men just like this? And now I'm part of it. So it goes back to the earlier question where we talked about making changes and being able to be that advocate. So now we have trans men in these spaces and they can stand up for women, not only trans women, but for women of all types. Yeah, you can add, I'm gonna just add real quick though, one, one funny story that you, you brought up from that. The very last week I was ever in a, a men's locker room doing, doing PT, I, I overheard one lieutenant say to another, hey, are we going to go clean the raccoons out of that radio tower today? I'm like, oh, crap, we're all going to have raccoon removal training next week uh, because one of you is coming back injured. Uh, so, <laughs> Danny? I, I wanted to add, you know, okay, there's, you know, the five of us here, and it's five individual stories, a lot of similarities in the stories, but they're all different, too. Um, I also run a support group down in Fredericksburg, and like our last meeting, I actually had more trans men there than trans women. So I've got to meet them, and again, I found the same thing. Um, a lot of similarity in our stories, but very different stories, and I've learned a lot from them. Uh, but like, you know, the fight to try to get hormone therapy, there, there's, there's those similarities, and there's some differences too, but it's interesting. Yeah. So, Susan, I think we're turning it back over to you. But if you have more questions, we are happy to stick around and answer them. Or if they're individual, uh, that's just fine. Well, thank you so much. That was fantastic. And encourage everybody to buy the book behind the register. And uh, our panelists will be up here signing. So thank you all for coming. And uh, leave your chairs, uh, if you will. Thank you. Thank you all so much.